Well, this morning, uh, the message is going to be titled, A Parent, uh, Spirit-Filled Parenting. And uh, I realize, as Caitlin mentioned, that Father's Day can be just a day of mixed emotions, depending on the type of relationship that you had with your father. And not just that, but also um, if your father's passed on, this today can be a day that actually reminds you of how much you miss them, how much you love them. Uh, with that in mind, I thought it might be helpful for us to revisit a passage from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, um, which really highlights this idea of being filled with the Spirit and how the Spirit changes the dynamic of relationship between children and parents. So if you have a Bible, you can uh, pull it out, go to Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. It's also going to be on the slides behind me. This is what it reads. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Jesus, just as we sang, speak to us. Shape us through this word. Help us to understand it so that we can live it out faithfully. In your name we pray, amen. Now this section you need to understand of Ephesians, the chapters kind of make it a little bit confusing because uh, this was part of what in the first century was called like household codes, and it actually starts at the very end of Ephesians 5. Um, and Paul will start by framing this entire section of relationship between husbands, wives, kids, parents, with being filled with the Spirit. And when that happens... These relationships are totally transformed. They actually look like the way Jesus would interact with these different people. And so people don't fight to have power over one another. They actually seek to come under one another, which is why Paul will highlight that one of the impacts of being filled with the Spirit is people actually submitting to one another. We're called to be filled with the Spirit, and this is an ongoing thing. When you put your trust in Jesus... You are given the Spirit, and yet there's this invitation for us to regularly be, to go on being filled with the Spirit. And one of the central things that happens as the Spirit of God comes and dwells in us is this complete flipping of social norms. When the Spirit fills you, you begin to think and act and speak like Jesus. Out go the ways of control, domination, coercion, manipulation, and income, surrender, service, and sacrificial love. We put down those old ways that we once operated and that we once learned it so that we can pick up this new way of coming under. This is what Jesus did for us. Jesus says in Matthew, I think uh, the next slide actually says the exact passage, Matthew, Matthew 20, is it? Yeah. Jesus says, The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. As the people of God, we are called to follow in the way of our King, Jesus. And that's part of what is going on here. Paul, in this por portion of Ephesians, is applying the work of Jesus' Jesus's work on the cross to family relationships. And we need to understand how that was uh, different than what we would have seen in the first century. In Greek and Roman culture, there was this Roman law of patria, potestas. A father had virtual life and death power not only over his slaves, but over his entire household at the time. He could cast out any of them, sell them as slaves, or even kill them, and be accountable to no one. A newborn child was placed at its father's feet to determine its fate, and if the father picked it up, the child was allowed to stay in the home. If the father walked away, it was simply disposed of. Discarded infants who were healthy and vigorous were collected and taken each night to the town forum, where they would be picked up and raised to be slaves or prostitutes. That was the norm at that time. In our time, it may, may not be like that, and we might hear that and be like, that's so messed up. But in our time, children can become idols, or they can be sacrificed on the altar of convenience. Tim Keller notes, we may not actually burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community, to achieve, to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. Now contrast that picture, whether in our time or in the first century, with what Jesus says in Matthew 19. 
He gives us, he shows us his heart for children when he, it says in Matthew 19, then people br brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. We do so much damage when we value comfort, money, prestige, more than the opportunity we have to love and influence children. So let's be people who value them. They're not burdens for 18 years, and then you're free. Most of you are like, yeah, of course not. I still feel that, and they're not in the well past 18. They are forever blessings. I remember uh, one of our, our mentors when we uh, found out that we were expecting Isaiah. They were so excited for us. And they, and they talked about how children really are this forever blessing. And that phrase always stuck with me. Because yes, there's challenges, but they're immense gifts. Jesus recognizes that. Let's be a people who recognize it. They will not complete you. Their needs will often expose where you actually draw your strength from and your wisdom from. One of the things I love about Cascade's story is that the very first members of our church were children. The very first people that our church was reaching out to were children. That was that heartbeat of Jesus being expressed in the people of Jesus here all those years ago. Now Paul, he starts off his let, uh, this portion here, he says, Children, obey your parents. See, when the Spirit comes among his people, one of the things that happens is children actually obey their parents. Believe it or not, they obey their parents. Now, yeah, you're scoffing, but it happens. It happens when the Spirit is at work in them. Paul speaks to children first, and you and I, we hear that, and we think nothing of it. We, don't, we don't, probably didn't even notice it. But this was radical in Paul's time. In the first century, children were never addressed like this. Only the husband, only the father it was. But Paul is basically saying, that's not how it works among God's people. That's not how it works among God's people. There's this flipping of those social norms I mentioned. This is the dignity and respect that Jesus begins to give to every human being, given even to children. And there's a responsibility that children actually have as part of God's new humanity. Paul's speaking directly to them, which suggests, one, that they're old enough to understand uh, what's going on. Two, that they're conscious and old enough to be able to have a relationship with Jesus but still young enough to be in the process of being brought up. And then Paul will say, the reason children are to obey is because it's righteous, because it is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Literally, it's righteous, meaning it's as God intended. It's properly ordered in the world. Paul in Romans 1 will talk about uh, the disobedience of children as an all-too-common Gentile sin. But obedience forms character by submitting and training the will, and it trains us for discipleship. Yet notice that he says, obey your parents in the Lord. That part's like really easy for us to miss. It's, it's vital because in the Lord is what makes obeying possible. Apart from Jesus, removed from Jesus, your relationship with your parents is informed, sustained, in, and motivated in one way, but when you put your trust in Jesus and are filled with the Spirit, you obey your parents because you recognize there is another relationship that informs, sustains, and empowers it. And that's your relationship with Jesus, the Lord. See, in God's new humanity, families don't get abolished. They're renewed by the Spirit of God and remodeled in the way of Jesus. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus has changed everything. Sin and evil, what Paul and pa what ca Paul will call the principalities and powers, previously corrupted, distorted, and destroyed human relationships. But when Jesus conquered them through his death on the cross, he began to undo their work. And he is now restoring those relationships. So, what if you are not, you are no longer that child who's being raised by your parents, but you still have your parents around. Does that mean this doesn't apply to you? Well, you may not be under obligation to obey them anymore. You're not living under their roof or anything like that. 
you're still called to honor them. That part never changes. Notice in verse 2, it says, Honor your father and your mother. Paul will go on to say, This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on earth. Virtually every society recognizes that parental authority is indispensable for the flourishing of a society. And that connects to this point here. And Paul will connect, actually references two passages here in verse 2. One is in Exodus 20, where we have the command to, to honor your mother and father. But we also have a reference to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5 or 16, that it may go well with you and that you may uh, live long in the land. Parents are meant to actually like mediate what God is like to their children. They mediate God's authority and his love. They are meant to show us. That doesn't mean it happens, but that's what they're meant to do. And all of us have experienced, though, moments where our father or our mother wronged us. They didn't mediate God's love to us. They showed us selfishness and patience. They were absent or judgmental. And honoring them was really hard in that moment. For some of us, they weren't just moments, though. They actually were the basis of our entire relationship with them. The relationship was actually defined by brokenness and hurt. And wherever you are on that relational spectrum with your parents, the truth is that we'll all struggle with this tension of how to honor our mother and our father. The Greek word for honor is this word, time, and it has this idea of recognizing the value of something. And that's part of what Paul is getting at here. Because one of the questions that comes up is, how can we honor our mothers or fathers, even if there is that disappointment and wounding? See, we're called to honor the role of a father, of a mother, even if the person who holds that role has not fulfilled it well. Just like we're called to pray for our political leaders, even when they're not fulfilling their roles well, we still are called to pray for them. So how might we do this? Is there a way that you can honor the office of mother or father, even if they didn't hold it well? Well, John Tyson, uh, he's written a book called The Intentional Father, and he highlights uh, three things that I think are really helpful. We honor their story. We can honor them, despite them maybe not holding that office well, by honoring their story. When we know what their life was like, how they were raised by their parents, what were the different things they went through. This actually allows us to empathize with them and understand them and even have grace for what they've been through. Many times when we first meet someone and they rub us the wrong way, it's really easy just to want to push away. But when we learn about their story, what they've lived through, it just changes the dynamic because we have this understanding. And you may not agree and you may not love some of the things that they do, but there's this different posture your heart has towards them, even if they have wounded you. So honor their story. You can also honor their sacrifice. And this one may be a little bit harder, but are there any sacrifices that they made to get you where you are? In my situation, there's a really big one. My parents left Honduras and came to Canada. They left all of their family. Every Sunday, our family would have uh, a meal together, and my parents were here knowing everyone was getting together each Sunday after church to get together, and they were on their own here, adjusting to that, trying to start a new life in their 30s. That was a sacrifice my parents made. What, 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 what might be a sacrifice that your mother or your father made to get you where you are? Third, honor their strengths. This is about seeking to recognize them and, and what even a small area of a strength that you benefit, benefit from and perhaps the ways in which our world benefited through their presence and through their strength and their presence in our world. The, the purpose of this is to honor them. And this is hard when they've wounded us and this thing sometimes ongoing. And this is why we need the Spirit of God to empower us because this is not easy. And this doesn't mean that we pass on that brokenness to our own kids. See, every parent has to reckon with the hurtful things that our parents did to us, but then also find a new way to write, find a way to write a new story in their family. 
and in some cases to lay an entirely different foundation. Some of you guys have talked about that with me or shared it even on social media about how God has done that in your lives. See, we have an invitation from Jesus to honor parents who have hurt us, which is every single one of us in this room. And so this week, would you take a moment, if you're able, to reach out to your parent, to your father or your mother, and recognize what you can. This isn't sweeping everything under the roof. This is just honoring the good that is there. You can write them a letter. You can tell them to their face. But would the word that you speak over them be honor? And this can really be hard, but there is blessing. There is a blessing that comes here in refusing bitterness and moving towards healing. The motivator that Paul will add in this passage is, um, is that honoring your parents leads to blessing. The power of honor is that you release this blessing. There's this great blessing that comes. It goes well with you, Paul says. Why? Why does it go well with you? Well, one reason is that honor is the operating system of the kingdom of God. That's how John Tyson puts it. Honor is the operating system of the kingdom of God. When you honor your mom, your dad, even when they've hurt you, you are living as a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's a sign that you're actually being filled with the Spirit. When Paul says it may go well with you, he's not just speaking, though, of an individual level, like just you alone, the discreet person. He's talking also on a communal level, the community of God, seeing that when children honor their parents, it leads to the flourishing of the family for the people of God and beyond. So there's this picture here of obeying your parents and also honoring them. But then in verse 4, Paul shifts things. I learned my lesson from two weeks ago, guys. In verse 4, Paul shifts things from the children to the parents. And, and this is what I would think of. Spirit-filled parents are called to train up their children in the way of Jesus. Paul lays out the strokes here saying, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, the word here for fathers is interesting. It's uh, pateres. It, is, it can be used for fathers and mothers, like the Greek word adelphoi, which refers to both brothers and sisters, which is why some translations will render this, if, and maybe yours is different, as parents, not father. The NIV, if you look in your footnotes, it'll actually say parents in the footnote, but put fathers as the main translation. So it's possible that it's referring to parents here. It's also possible Paul is only thinking of fathers. What Paul is calling his God's people to, though, is to live in a new way, in the way of Jesus, to train up their children in the way of Jesus. And this is different from the Greek way of thinking and a, even a Jewish way of thinking to an extent. Let me just talk about the Greek vision for parenting. Fathers were the primary influence. Children were with their moms until they were about seven, and then it was the father's responsibility to educate them from ages seven through 16. At this time, there weren't public schools, so it was the dad's job to train up their kids. And it was more than just learning to read or to write. <clears throat> it was training them in ethics, in the uh, local religion. It was uh, teaching them household management, philosophy, and even public service. So there was this totally different picture of what a father's job was amongst the Greeks. Now, the Hebrews also had a vision for parenting. And Philo, he was a Jewish philosopher. He writes this, Since Jews esteem their laws as divine revelations and are instructed in the knowledge of them from their earliest youth, they bear the image of the law in their souls. They are taught, so to speak, from their swaddling cloths by their parents, by their teachers, and by those who bring them up, even before instruction in the sacred laws and unwritten customs, to believe in God, the one Father and Creator of the world. Now, Josephus, he was a historian, and he, uh, he, he wrote this. He said, our ground is good, and we work it to the utmost, but our chief ambition is for the education of our children. We take most pains of all in the instruction of children and esteem the observation of the laws and the piety corresponding with them, the most important affair of our whole life. 
So whether it was a Hebrew vision of parenting or a Greek vision, they, they had a vision for parenting, for what it looked like. And I, if you were to ask yourself, what is like the modern day vision for parenting? I don't think we would have like a very clear idea for how that I- is. I think we would struggle with that. I would struggle with that. Um, part of it we would think of is like public schools or schools in general is the main place where our kids are going to be educated. And uh, the key goal would be ac- academic excellence so that they can succeed in whatever they do in their careers. Uh, amongst Christians, there can be this tendency to really hope that there's a great Sunday school and a great youth group at your church so that the, your kids can really learn how to follow Jesus. And then, of course, we have like iPhones, right, and Google, which is like, yeah, Google how you do this, figure it out. The way of Jesus calls us to more than what the Greek vision had, more than what the Hebrew vision was, even more than the vision of today. It calls us first, Paul will say, not to provoke your children to anger. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's our responsibility as parents to raise and develop up our children. Schools have a role to play. I'm thankful for public schools. I went to a public school. That, like, they're great. There's nothing against them. They have a role to play. So do churches. But parents cannot be replaced. They are indispensable. And if you're a father or a mother, you have a vital role to play in the life of your child. Parents need to be intentional and regular in their teaching of their kids and to practice patience as they do it. Your first task as a parent is not to discourage their hearts. Paul will say, don't provoke your children to anger. You have authority over your children, but not to provoke them to discouragement. Because you are not free to do what you want to do anymore. You are under the lordship of Jesus. Children in the first century didn't have rights. So fathers could treat their kids, slaves and wives, like an object. And of course, not every man did, but that's what they had the authority to do in the first century. And Paul insists that children cannot be treated that way. They are worthy of respect. Do not provoke your children to anger. So what provokes your kids to anger? Well, just think of it for yourself. How, what provokes you to anger? What, pro, uh, what makes you discouraged? What drives you to angry, angry exasperation, bitterness, resentment? These, this is about the attitudes the words, the actions that push your kids, whether young right now or older and adults, towards these types of feelings. Let me just uh, share with you eight uh, things that I've kind of compiled that discourage kids' hearts. One is just an unnecessarily severe discipline. This is where the consequences just outweigh the offense. Two, a failure to take into account that they're just kids. You're demanding more of them than what they are capable of actually doing because of their age, because of their uh, uh, emotional uh, maturity, because of how much energy they just have, because of their ability to focus. Three, failure to express our love and approval from them. In fact, it's like withdrawing love from them when they don't do something or overprotecting them. Four is an arbitrariness. This is applying rules and consequences as you please, there's, uh, it's just random. There's no system of logic, so you're upset sometimes about one thing, but other times you're not. Five, unfairness. Unjust and just un- con- not concerned with what is just and right and discourage children. Six, this constant nagging and condemnation, just is words that tear down and weigh down. Seven, Subjecting children to humiliation, publicly or privately demeaning their self-worth, denying them the dignity that they are worthy as an image bearer of God. And eight, any and all forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs and sensibilities. Every single one of these provokes, discourages, and wounds. And to some extent, we've all experienced one or two or more of these One of the things that you can do as a parent, even if they are adults, is ask them this question humbly. What am I 
What am I doing right now that is beating you down? What am I doing right now that is beating you down, that is discouraging you? And this is a scary question to ask because you don't necessarily want to hear what it is. It never feels good to find out you've hurt someone. And sometimes we do it unintentionally. Some, sometimes the ways that we communicate non-verbally s- sends a message to our kids. And our kids know it because they felt it over and over again growing up. But I think doing this models humility to them. That you do love them. That you are not trying to discourage them. That you don't want to be like that. That's the work of the Spirit in you. What am I doing right now that is beating you down? The way I would think about it for younger children is, is there anything I did today that made you sad? Is there anything I did that made you mad? See, if you are in Christ, you inhabit God's story. You've been given the Spirit, and He can fill your whole home, your life. And what Paul is doing is saying explicitly that the old way of parenting, of being a mom, a dad, are no longer appropriate for the people of God. You don't get to do it your way. You don't get to say, well, that's how I learned, so that's what you got to deal with. You have a new vision, a new story for your family because you are in Christ. And so Paul will say, don't provoke them to anger, but bring them up in in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. One of the things that is this call for all believers is to release this blessing on your kids by breaking the generational strongholds that have gripped your family. And every single one of us in our families, we got our own stories of things that were beautiful that we love about our family to this day. And then there's other things that we're not as public about, but they're in our family. And some of them get passed on, and they're the things we don't want to. And the task for us as followers of Jesus is to break those things so that they don't get passed on. That is a life, lifelong calling, and it's one that we walk with in humility, but we don't do it in our, on our own. The Spirit of God empowers us. And so this looks different for each family. It may be refusing to pass on being an emotionally absent father or an overworking father or a critical mom or a parent who is so proud that they can never admit that they were wrong or that they need help. It may be this manipulation and controlling of circumstances. You must turn from these old and destructive ways and ask God to lead you in a new way. Sometimes you can't even just do it with you and your church. You actually need counseling. And that's good. There's no shame in that. It's healthy. Don't be so proud that you cannot reach out and ask for help. Recognize that it's not just for you or for your spouse, but for your kids and their kids. Give your kids that blessing by not passing it on. And other times, it's not even that. It's just releasing this blessing by listening to your kids work through what they are sensing God doing in their life. And then simply affirming them and freeing them up to obey the Lord. And I remember my my dad did that for me. I was trying to discern going into ministry or into missions, and I didn't really know how to express it or articulate it at the time, but I remember sharing it with my dad, and my dad just listened, and he said, well, if that's what the Lord's leading you towards, then I bless you in that. Let me pray for you. And that was it. But there was this sense of affirmation of what the Lord was doing in my life through my dad. Sometimes us as parents, we can do that. You know, if, if, our, if we as parents have expectations for what we want our kids to do or be, that simple affirmation and praying for our kids can be such a great gift that blesses them and releases them. Second, when the Spirit uh, comes into our lives, we don't provoke our kids to anger and discouragement. Instead, we want to train them up. And Paul here, when he says train them up, he, he says... It's literally in the Greek, bring up your children in the upbringing. Discipline is this word, uh, paideia, and it can mean training or upbringing or even instruction. And interestingly, the the word that we get instruction is this, uh, forgive me for this, any Greek speakers, nuthesia. It translates as admonish, but it also includes this understanding of verbal education. 
So this training and verbal education has a specific content, though. The Lord. Discipline and instruct them in the Lord. I mean, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach your children Jesus Christ and his ways. That is the goal for us as parents who follow Jesus, is for our children to come to Jesus and then to place themselves under his authority, under his lordship. And there are three parts to this that researchers have noted for followers of, like disciples of Jesus, how you can have resilient disciples. Three things that are key to that happening in the life of um, children as they grow up. It's not just one thing, but really these three key things, relationships, scripture, and experiences. Let me just uh, outline that a bit. I think there's a slide for it too. One is like modeling what following Jesus looks like in your life this relationship with them second is teaching and encouraging them to learn the scriptures and third is creating environments where jesus can be encountered that's the experiences this first one it's it's using your life as you live and follow jesus and place yourself under his authority to show your children what that's like introduce them to jesus by walking with jesus yourself that's why as a parent one of the most important things you can do is actually just walk with him faithfully consistently your habits at home model something to them i remember my grandpa when i would i only really got to see him once every five years on these family reunions he would wake up at six in the morning and pray and i was a little kid but i would see him doing it and i'm like oh he's getting up every day and doing this he wasn't trying to do that for me that was something that was a rhythm of his life but it modeled something to me we have that same opportunity with our children. Our behavior is not just a revealer, but also an instructor. We don't just train and teach our kids about Jesus and his way. We also model following him to them. And as Christian parents, our job is to model what that's like in our behavior and in what we teach. So if they never see us forgive, apologize, repent, if they never see us practice generosity, if they never see us serve, if they never see us studying the scriptures or praying for the salvation of others, how can we expect them to want to go and do it? If they don't see us ever be concerned for justice in this world, for the poor, how can we expect them to care for those things too? Because there's brokenness in us, there's going to be moments where we get it wrong. So one of the clearest things that kids need to see is parents repenting. (laughs) They just got to see it because every day we get it wrong. Repentance needs to be common in our homes. And reconciliation needs to be practiced amongst our kids. I didn't respond in the way that Jesus did. I'm sorry, and I commit to changing my ways. And when we correct them, we demonstrate to them how Jesus responds to them in their errors and mistakes. Who is it that you want to show them? Do you want to show them Jesus or do you want to show them your brokenness? Our goal isn't perfect obedience for them, for them to be perfectly obedient. It's this loving commitment and surrender to Jesus. And when that is our goal, then the way we parent them and instruct them and discipline them is totally different. Jesus is a person. He's not a set of behaviors. We want them committed to him, not just doing this and not doing that. Those are totally different things. We intent- number two is that we intentionally teach kids scriptures. Mothers and fathers have, to, fathers have to see it's not just the responsibility of the church to educate and train their kids. Parents play this instrumental role in teaching and shaping them. And we live in a time where there is a, a com- uh, an alternative and very um, attractive m- worldview that does not align with the way of Jesus. And the scriptures call us to actually live into the story that God is writing and has already begun to write. We are swimming against the heavy current, and we need resilient disciples of Jesus, which means we need to actually train our kids to know the story, to live in the story, and actually understand it as we see it in the scriptures. And some of us, because that never happened in our own lives, it feels really hard to do. But one of the biggest comforts you can take is knowing that actually just being intentional and showing up 
is one of the most important things you can do here. It's not about a specific method, but if you consistently and faithfully show up, it will bear fruit in the life of your children. Three, is create an environment where Jesus can be encountered. And this is referring to things like summer camps, retreats, mission trips, or, um, and serving. All of these can have a great impact on young people. They're kind of like the bi- big ones that people will think of. These are often the first uh, powerful encounters that people have with Jesus. And we can't dismiss this. This is, for many of us, what Anvil was. Yet, we need to recognize that you can do this in the everyday as well. This is where your family culture matters, the vision of your family culture. They can be formed over a long time through things like family uh, devotional times or, or songs or having a meal that you share together or a game. The, these don't have to be huge events all the time. But being interested in our children's lives and using what is going on in their lives as this launch pad to help them encounter Jesus. It may be what challenges they're facing at school or the questions their uh, classmates are asking. The books of Daniel, Esther, First and Second Peter reveal how God's people lived in times where they were a minority and they felt pressure from the dominant culture and yet they remained faithful. And the call for us living in a city like Vancouver is the same. It's to remain faithful and resilient. So, children in this room, how can you honor your parents today? Your, your dad, your mom. And maybe writing them a letter and telling them what you see, their story, their strengths, their sacrifices, and thanking them for what they deposited in you. It may be asking for forgiveness for those moments where you didn't obey or honor them and reconciling with them. Parents, is there anything you've done to discourage your kid? If you're not sure, you might want to ask them. Your humility can be a place where God works to bring healing and restoration. There is always an opportunity to turn to Jesus and make things right, to own the sin, to own the failure, to model the humility and the heart of reconciliation to them. Even if you're this par- a parent of a grown child, I've experienced my dad do it, and it's, it was powerful. Parents aren't perfect, but we can model humility. And so 